you know what skunk works are, you know, the super secret skunk works up in the high desert. Uh, we're Ben Rich, he wrote the book Skunk Works, and um, before he passed away, he's the one who said, well, see, he said several things. One thing he said, there are no private conversations anywhere on earth. This was in the 90s, so he was way ahead of Edward Snowden. Um, <laughs> number two, anything you can imagine, we've already done at the Skunk Works. And number three, we already have the technologies to go travel amongst the stars. In fact, we can take E.T. home. <laughs> and the last thing he did in his slide was to show this, this black disc going out into space. And it was a, it was a human, it was a, it was a man-made uh, electromagnetogravitic EMG anti-gravity disc, which they have, and which we have had since October 1954 when we mastered gravity control. Um, so, <laughs> but the, the more profound thing is that people who've studied this begin to have experiences that are very, very strange. Because you can take these electronics and create this lifter effect of anti-gravity. So they're called lifters. And um, the way it is done is that you, at a high enough voltage with a counter-rotating field, you can cause lift. And this is if you go all the way back to the, uh, the uh, experiments of T. Townsend Brown, who, of course, ended up being the guy at the starting of the RAND Corporation. Um, his stuff went to the Air Force, went black. Um, or the Klosky Frost experiment in 1920, late 20s in Germany. They were doing things with crystalline structures, and they would create a high voltage field around them and found that, especially with crystals, they would kind of begin to resonate and expand, grow, or take up more space, and then they'd float and lift. 20s. 1920, I mean, before any of us were, I suspect between, before any of us were alive, I don't think there's anyone here who was alive in the 28 and 29 time period. Um, not even I. But, so, we have this amazing heritage that unfortunately has been confiscated into covert programs. But the people that I've dealt with, I now have 500, over 500 people I've met with, like the guys at Lockheed Skunk Works and Northrop and the agencies, three literary agencies, who've shared this with me, and the senior scientists here in the Naval Research Labs in DC, which is the largest Department of Defense lab, was in, quote, the vault and saw the documents that October 1954 is when we completed all the studies for gravity control. So we haven't needed rockets, jets, cars, trains, buses, trucks, ships on the ocean using combustible fuels or nuclear power since October 1954. Now, it was being studied before then for a couple decades, but it was mastered. That's when they mastered gravity control. And what a shame it is. You look at the world, and we're destroying the world geopolitically and environmentally and every other way because of this secrecy. And the secrecy is something that I understand but do not agree with. You have to understand it. You don't have to agree with it. And I understand it in a compassionate way. I mean, I talked to the colonel who was in charge of future technologies for the Air Force, a euphemism for not future, things we already have. It's, it's always a double speak when you deal with the military. Um, so this guy knew about this, and he said, you know, those things can be weaponized. I said, yes, you already have. They're already weaponized. I said, I can't tell you how many patients I took care of in the emergency department who were killed with knives, steak knives, butter knives, and killed with I said, everything can be weaponized. The question is, do we let human society terminate fighting over the last barrel of oil and destroying the biosphere, or do we find a way to live together peacefully in an enforceable peace? Maybe it may be the peace of the chained dogs initially, because there are always going to be madmen out there but allow these sciences to come out so we don't cannibalize the earth. Because we're 100 years into a period when all, everything I'm telling you should have been known and out, at least in terms of the theoretical physics, the applied free energy materials should have been out in, by the turn of the last century, early 1900s, and the electromagnetogravitics 50s, 40s and 50s, which of course Werner von Braun was working on with 
Adolf Hitler in Germany. That was their secret weapon. Um, we were doing the atomic bomb, they were doing anti-gravity. But we have this period in our, in our history right now where we've sort of gone past the red line of disclosure, where we should have had these things disclosed and put into peaceful application before I was born, as I was born in 1955. So I think that when we look at this, we have to say, you know, it's a little bit like Gloria Steinem when she used to say, the, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> Uh, love it, uh, love it, love it, love it. Uh, but we, we're at, at this point, we're gonna have to decide them to make these changes, but first we have to understand what we're dealing with here. Uh, and we really have to begin to understand the power of the conscious mind and these technologies and how they come together. Because when we're out there making contact with these civilizations, we're actually pulling together amazing science and technology, even though you may not fully understand, but the things that are happening are amazing. And therefore, the phenomena that can happen are amazing. And that's why you need this understanding, this scientific and intellectual understanding to understand the experience you will have, or may have already had, and didn't understand what happened when you had it. Like when you had that at the Outer Banks. Uh, that's why the you know, the men who've worked in these projects, and some of the women, um, like this guy at the Lockheed Skunk Works, he, he knew about some of this, but not all of it. He knew more about the, the just the more mainline anti-gravity stuff, or electromagnetogravitic, because that's the proper term. Anti-gravity sort of a pop culture term. It's incorrect. It's not anti-gravity. It just creates a mass cancellation effect of an object so it floats. And if you cancel the mass enough, think about it. If you create a voltage around an object where the mass becomes less and less and less, what happens when the mass goes to zero? It disappears, correct. It vanishes to the eye and all detection systems and it's moved into another dimension. And it's in that state that it goes from this star system to another one. Get it? Does this make sense to people? Now I'm, this is beginning to make sense. So when these pilots and people come to me with the experience, now they're going to come with an empirical observation, and they don't have the background. I will try to explain to them what, why that 747 and this massive craft went from here to here and looked like it vanished, and, or the one that's going on your wingtip was hovering there, and all your instruments were going nuts on board, and it just dematerialized and vanished. It's, there's nothing metaphysical about it. It's an actual hard science, a very well understood hard science, but it's not something you can take at a course at MIT. So this is your MIT course. So, <laughs> uh, for now. For now, someday, you know, this will be mainstream education. Uh, I hope. Soon. Uh, maybe not soon, but it, the sooner the better. The, be you know, the, the kids coming along need to understand this. This particular uh, scientist, getting back to his experience, the reason he called me up was not to tell me about the time he was operating a radar system and an ET craft came in and did all this amazing stuff, which is in the disclosure book. It was that he had an experience that he didn't understand. A personal experience. This is why a lot of these guys end up getting in, in touch with me. It's very funny. And I go, okay, so I'm on the phone. I think he heard me on a radio show or something, or, and so he says, well, Doc, I was practicing a meditation discipline back in the 60s called uh, Roycecrucians or something like that, yeah, the Roycecrucian, and he was trying to learn how to, what they call astrally project, where your body of light and consciousness sort of lifts up out of your physical body and flies around, like a lucid flying dream, but sort of on command instead of accidentally. And I said, oh, cool. You ever have any success with that? He says, yes, let me tell you. <laughs> and, and he says, but it has to do with this issue. I said, oh, really? Uh, and so he said, well, I was there and I was trying too hard. He wasn't relaxing deeply enough. And so his teacher one day said, look, you know how to do this. You just need to let go and let it happen. And I guess he just, the right thing was said to him so he was able to do it. So he, he lay down on his bed and he was doing whatever technique they use. I'm, I've never taken that course, but um, he went 
out of his body, lifted up, and initially just kind of lifted up, and then he just, he got so excited, he went right up through, through the roof, the ceiling of the house, and into the sky and into the atmosphere, and then slammed into the side of an extraterrestrial vehicle. Now he's fully lucid awake. And he said that, <laughs> he said that the, the ETs on board, which were around four or five feet tall and very thin, no, ha no hair, were at some control and they were observing. And they were, they were hovering in the atmosphere, but not visible to the eye because they were shifted into this other dimension. And he, when he hit the spacecraft, the craft moved, but it was not his <laughs> physical body, it was his astral body, the, the body of light that you fly around in. And he says, I don't understand how an interstellar vehicle, because he knew they existed, could be affected. I said, because it had shifted its resonant frequency beyond the crossing point of light, the speed of light and matter and electrons, into a dimension that is closely approximates the astral body field, that energy field that the mystics called astral. And since it was of a similar density to your own, it could interface with it. The funniest part of the story, uh, after he said, oh, I've wondered my whole life how that could have happened, um, he popped inside and they looked at him like, my God, why don't you watch where you're going? You know, I said, mm -hmm. They did, it was like, it was kind of like appalled at this interstellar faux pas. And uh, I was like, well, you can watch where you're going, you know.